Hi, it's Alan Edelman and Philip the Corgi, and I'd like to talk about the kind of parallel computing that you might very well be able to do on your own laptop or desktop. You see, I have on my new Mac, yes, Philip, that's right, I have on my new Mac a 10 core Intel Core i9. So, what that makes me think is that if I'm running a complicated simulation, I should be able to be able to accelerate it, maybe even up to a factor of, of 10, perhaps. So how would you do that? Well, let me give a little bit of background first about parallel computing. Uh, I myself have been working on parallel computers for a long time. When I was a graduate student, I got to work on this lovely machine. I still think it's the winner of the best looking computer beauty contest ever. This is the Connection Machine CM2 um, and the Associated Data Vault. It was made by a company that was called Thinking Machines. And there were these beautiful blinking red lights. And we used to talk about how to get a gigaflop or a billion operations per second, like you know, floats, multiplies, and adds out of that machine. Now your laptop can do that sort of thing. So this was an example of a distributed computer uh, and here I searched Google for distributed computing just to see what I would see. I guess lots of pictures of computers all over the place. These are the sorts of computers that you'll probably find on the top 500 uh, benchmark. In fact, here, let's just go over the top 500 and see what we see over there. So uh, there's this famous benchmark and you can go and look and see the 500 fastest computers according to a certain linear algebra benchmark that's out there. Another kind of parallel computing happens on GPUs. And here I just took a look and see what Google would give me on GPUs. Usually it's NVIDIA these days, but uh, uh, AMD and Intel are certainly following suit. So this is another kind. But uh, for now, for, for this little lecture, I think I'm only going to consider uh, multi-threading, which is what I can do on my desktop right here. So multi-threaded computing. You know, and just here you can see the kind of uh, pictures of lots and lots of computational threads that can get spawned um, in, a, in a shared memory machine like I have, like my desktop. And it's very likely these days that your, your laptop or desktop might have two or four uh, cores if it's a little older, um, uh, maybe more if it's a little newer or if it's more top of the line. Uh, but in any event, my guess is you probably already have the ability to do the kind of parallelism that uh, that I'm going to show you today. So uh, to to get started, you launch Julia like one like you always do. Here it's on my Mac. You can see I'm launching Julia, and I'm going to use a Jupyter notebook. So I'm going to it's called using iJulia. I'm not using Pluto today. I'm going to use Jupyter. Uh, just because I think it was a little easier to demonstrate what I wanted to today with, with Jupyter Notebooks. And a key command that you'll need if you want to do this is you have to install a kernel with as many threads as you like. And this is a, a command that's commented here. Uh, you actually run it once per Julia install. So I, I did it a while ago, and so I won't need to do it again. Uh, and I actually did it with 10 threads. So this, this four here and this four here. I would have replaced with 10 for my computer. And then finally, um, I'm gonna start up the notebook, which is what I did over here. And that will lead me to the uh, notebook, which I'd like to show you, okay? So what I thought I would do is I would uh, take this problem that I showed you before. Um, you might remember if you had seen the previous video from lecture nine, computational thinking, I took a problem, a birthday problem, and I showed how you could simulate it on a serial computer. Just to, it was a probability puzzle, and I just wanted to show you how you could simulate it. Well, now I'm gonna show you how to do that same problem in parallel. So first of all, uh, by the way, I copied, I copied the command that you need at the REPL, which is the terminal window uh, here. You don't use it inside of Jupyter, you use it at the terminal window. But uh, in any event here, let's, uh, why don't we, let's clear all the, the cells so we can kind of feel like we're starting from the beginning. Okay, so 
um, we need these packages for various reasons. Okay, here's the birthday problem that I showed in the previous video. If you don't remember it, the basic story is you've got 20 people who have a birthday uniformly distributed from January to December, one through 12. And I'm going to count how many people have their birthdays in various months. So this would add up to 20. And I'm curious whether there is, um, whether there are four months that have two people having birthdays each and four months having three people having birthdays each, right? So that was kind of the, the, the probability puzzle. And we did it in before both with Monte Carlo and with exact mathematical techniques. And we got an answer that was pretty close to one in a thousand, all right? So this was not terribly likely, it's about one in a thousand, right? And if you wanna look at the next few digits, cause it has a simple pattern really, it's like, I don't know, I see even numbers, I see a pattern. 0604, if you wanna remember, 0604. So it's, it's 0 0.001, 0604, if you wanna re remember this number, okay? And if I were to run this birthday problem, say uh, I run it 10 million times, right? So each time I'm grabbing a group of 20 people virtually, I'm, this is my simulation, I'm grabbing 20 people and I'm getting, I'm, I'm generating random birthdays for them. And I'm wondering if the criterion of four months with two birthdays and four months with three birthdays holds. And if it does, I call it a success. And here you see it was the one in a thousand, but it's like 107, okay? And this took me 13 seconds, which is, you know, I'm, I'm not always so patient. That's kind of the uh, limits of my patience. Of course, if I'm gonna go get a cup of coffee, I might be willing to give it a minute or two. Uh, but, um, there, there it is, 10 million in serial. Now, another thing you might wanna do is not just look at the average, but actually look at the distribution. So here I'm going to, uh, to, to be clear, what I'm going to do is um, I am going to, e each data point is going to be 50,000 runs of the birthday problem. And I'm going to take an average, in other words, what I'm doing here, I did it with 10 million, but what I'm doing is I'm going to grab this number for as many times as I have T. So here T is hundred. And I'm just checking that the, uh, that I've actually done it a hundred times, but maybe more important is let me plot it. Now I'm gonna do it a thousand times to give it a, a better plot, right? And so what I'm gonna do is plot a histogram of a thousand runs of the birthday problem where each run is itself 50,000 runs. Okay, so let me say it clearly. I hope everybody sees what I'm doing. What I'm going to do is take, is, is each run, each individual run is 20 people having birthdays. I'm gonna do 50,000 times and I'm gonna average and that's gonna give me a single number. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is a thousand times from there, I'm going to get a thousand data points and histogram. Okay, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what, what's going to happen. Okay, now, while I'm waiting, this is a good chance for me to tell you that parallel computing is a great thing. The ability to have more processors than one go and attack your problem is a terrific thing. But very, very often, people go right to parallelism before even examining their serial problem. And often there could be some really great speed ups to possibly obtain just by going serial. Here's my histogram. There's a nice picture with a thousand. It's not, it's getting smooth. It's not perfectly smooth. You could imagine that it might be nice to be able to run this with more data points or run it faster. Okay, and that's what we're gonna get to. Okay, but before we go parallel, let me talk about this version of the birthday problem. The only Difference here is I put in this macro, this S vector, static vector. And let's just see what happens by doing that. It doesn't change any of the computation, but look, this is now only 3.5 seconds. What was it before? Just we can go back and look. It was 13 seconds before you see, right? And now it's only 3.5 seconds. Okay, so what does this do? Well, here we're telling Julia this is all in serial, that this vector is known to be of length 20, right? This is the, this random set of months for 20 people 
it's known to be of length 20, you can use this information, right? And so if you tell Julia that it can use the fact that it's, it, it's, it's static, it's, it's a low number, it's a 20. So this static vector is good for, for small numbers. Maybe 20, 25 is the limit. Some people would say just do it up to 10, but it really works here up to, up to 20. Um, you would certainly not do this for a vector of length 100 or, or bigger, okay? But we put in the static vector and we got 3.5 seconds. Well, if static vector is a good idea, we should do it twice. So I did it again, this time in the counts vector, let's tell the uh, underlying compiler that this vector is going to be of length 12 by putting an S vector in. And we'll run the same code now. And let's see how long it takes. And 1.6 seconds, right? And so I've gone from the 13 seconds to 1.6 seconds. You know, what is that? Like a factor of eight or something without any parallelism at all, right? Just by typing S vector, by just simply knowing that using static arrays of various, uh, in, in various ways in Julia is a great way to get performance, okay? Well, now that I've done that, and I've kind of done what I think I know how to do for the serial computation, though I think there are more games to be played even in serial, but uh, now I'm perfectly ready to go parallel. And I'm going to go parallel using this relatively new package that I'm kind of excited about, this F loops package. Uh, my uh, colleague, Chris Rokakis, pronounces this, nobody knows how to pronounce this, is it F loops or floops? He just calls it fruit loops. So I don't know, that's sort of silly, but maybe if you want to call it fruit loops, that's fine as well. So um, we'll use this F loops compiler. And what this is going to let me do is actually get the parallelism. And so what we're going to do is we're going to copy basically the code. I guess I could have put it inside a function, but we're going to copy the code that uh, lets you run the birthday problem. And I'm going to put a loop around it. So here, what we're going to do is count the successes. I'm going to put a loop around it. Um, and this is this F loop. And I'm basically going to say that each core can run, I want this to run T times total. So I'm going to divide up the work. If I have N cores and I want it to run T times, each one can go T divided by N cores um, amount of the work. Okay, and um, so if we do that, we'll see uh, here I'm running on one core. I got 1.6 seconds. If I do it on two cores, it's a bit faster. Let me see if it, we run it again. It's about 0.8 seconds, okay? Um, four cores is about half again. It's about 0.4 seconds. I'm gonna to move to five cores. Oh, that was a pretty good jump. Let me go back to four just to see. Yeah, five is, is 0.2. I mean, these things are not always easily explained, but as long as you get the speed up, one is happy. And here I could do it in 10 cores and I only get a little speed up over the five cores. Um, but at least I get the speed up, right? And so now I'm able to run 10 million in just 0.2 seconds, right? And uh, we could also, here I'm gonna run a couple of more simulations. I'm gonna add more factors of 10. So this was 10 million, this is gonna be 1 billion, and this is gonna be 10 billion. So, and I'll run it at the full number of cores that I have, 10 cores. And it might be of some interest to see, remember the answer is like 10604, Right, and so I was just curious how much closer we might get. So here we have 105 at the 10 million level, but at the 1 billion level, we're getting about 106, maybe even arguably 1060. So the usual story is that you have to go a factor of 100 to get another digit, right? Here I'm just going another factor of 10. So I think we'll just get like, it's not, I don't know if I should call it half a digit um, but that's the sort of thing that, that it would take to do. So while I'm waiting for this, I just want to go over here the basic, uh, the basic sort of paradigm of parallel computing here. What's going on is these three lines are being run over and over in, in so-called, some people call it embarrassing parallel mode or other people being using better choices of words, maybe call it pleasantly parallel. But the point is we're generating each of these instances. They're completely independent of each other, right? So 
Um, these things can be completely paralyzed. And then the only amount of sort of synchronization, the only place where there's communication among the threads is that we need to reduce. Uh, the, we're counting the successes individually, but really what we want is the total number of successes. So what I'd like to point out is we're gonna start out with a count of zero, and then we're gonna do a reduction with all of the successes. And then finally, since I want an average, I'll take all the successes and divide by the total number of tries, uh, and that gives me like a probability or an average. Okay, so this is sort of the basic setup. And what's kind of nice in Julia is you can do the same basic setup for not a count, but a histogram, right? So this is a count. And all I'm doing is adding the number zero or the number one at each time. But in a moment, what I'm going to want to do and you can see it over here, is I'm going to, instead of starting with a zero count, I'll do an empty histogram. So I'm simply gonna run the birthday distribution zero times, and that will give me exactly an empty histogram, okay? And then instead of the reduction being a plus, Julia has the possibility of merging histograms. So what I'm gonna do is create a new, uh, I'm gonna, do the birthday distribution sample, it's gonna result in a histogram and I'll simply merge the histograms. And so the ultimate return will be the combined histogram for all of my trials. And so this will allow me to run histograms presumably 10 times faster or I can get 10 times more data points for the same amount of time, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and run this and let me, in fact, I don't think we need this right now. So I think I'll just get rid of it. And what I'll just do is, um, I'll just wait for this to come out, but we're going to run 10,000 instances on 10 nodes, okay? And we'll plot it, okay? So the, what did we do before? We can double check. We ran 1,000. Okay, and so the 10,000 will be presumably in the same amount of time. Okay, and here you saw this was very, very choppy. And when this finally does converge, um, I'm quite certain, oh, it's already converged. Uh, oops, something, oh, I never executed the code, so let me, let's try, oh, so now I'm gonna have to wait again. But meanwhile, we could look at this answer. So you can see that, uh, this one that was 10 billion times, it took 204 seconds. So what's that, like three minutes and change? And uh, we were looking for 10604, and we've got certainly the 1060, this time 10601. So, you know, it's funny because one in a thousand kind of feels like a rare event. To me, it feels rare, one in a thousand. Uh, and yet, you know, on a computer, since you can run 10 billion trials, you realize that not only do you get plenty of successes, but you get just enough successes that you could even measure uh, close to, well, what, what would you call this? At least four significant digits of the probability, right? So that's pretty nice. And here, by the way, is the final run. So remember, we're looking for, let, here, let's put, let's grab that exact number. I had it over here, where was it? I certainly have it at the top. Here, let's just grab it from here. I want you to be able to, to think about the number. So um, what I'll do is I'll put it right here in the title. Why not? Okay, so now we can see the number. So that 00106 should probably land right around here. So the, the average is here, but you could see a certain spread around from the average. Okay, and mathematics tells us that in the long run, um, asymptotically, this thing would behave like a bell-shaped curve, right? And so there's a, there's a variance which measures the width of this. Um, and it's just nice to be able to see this in, on the computer. And it's just so easy to do this sort of parallelism uh, if you've got the cores on your uh, laptop or desktop. So there's nothing special, of course, about the birthday problem, um, but the ability to do parallel computing is, is certainly a good thing. Uh, one last thing I'll mention, uh, is if you're interested in this sort of thing, I gave a lecture at the IEEE meeting last year, the supercomputing meeting about 
parallel computing and committee. language. I'd like to thank the committee for the Fernbach Award. So I have really one topic and one topic only, and I have 30 minutes to, to try to hammer it in, and that's the power of language. Uh, I really believe that the most important intellectual problem for HPC is language, computing language for HPC. Uh, I think that the important uh, way that we're going to take our impact beyond 13,000 and go to 13 million, maybe even 9 billion, I believe is going to be through language. Right, so there, there's my main point. Um, you're welcome to go and watch this. I talk about the power of language for various purposes. Uh, but uh, uh, I do believe that this is the big problem in HPC. It's not how to parallelize your code. It's how to express the parallelism in your code. And we in the Julia world believe that we have all the right ingredients to uh, crack as pieces of this very, very hard problem. And that's exactly what we work on. Thank you very much.